There is further supporting experimental evidence in the form of what we call the Chevy-Chev gap bias. Not to be confused with the Chevy-Chev bias. The Chevy-Chev bias is a small bias among the primes <coughs> where primes uh, modulo 4 equaling 3 are slightly more frequent than those equaling 1. The remarkable fact is that the S model is completely unbiased to this form. We leave it to the reader to show this. And yet we have the remarkable calculation of Landau and Ramanujan. <coughs> and we believe now that all these uh, Euler-like uh, prime counting functions are legitimate. So what's happening? The bias constants are of the order of the twin prime constant, which is of the order uh, of occurring at about 1 over p with respect to the primes. And whatever modular form a prime takes, its square is always of the form 4n plus 1. A constant throughout this discussion is all prime squares begin their life in all uh, S models such that the prime is uh, the prime is less than the current prime. That is, up to the last instant, some prime squared is treated as a prime until that iteration. The disappearance of a single prime at that moment causes a single disappearance on the other side of the pivotal cousin to balance everything out, leaving the S model unbiased. This exactly accounts for the small bias in the midden of the Chevy-Chev bias, while allowing the rest of the local universe of the S model to remain unbiased. Another who ordered this observation. It gets much more interesting. The P squared exists until the last instant leaves an interesting scar in the gap distribution, because at that moment the average gap is the same on either side of the anchor. After the composite killing machine, this will leave a systematic scar, uh, though random, gap bias of near twice the local average. That is, if PKM is the largest prime such that PKM is less than uh, PM squared, then finding the gap uh, at that location, on average, it should be equal to 4 times uh, log P. That is, if you measure around the prime square, you get the expected average around 2p, or 2 log p. If you measure exactly at the prime square, and only the prime squares, your average gap will be twice your expected value. We used Mathematica to sample 501 squares, starting at index 1, 5,000, 10,000, and so on to 145,000. And the results are spectacular. The model gives no hint to the strength of the effect, but it is very strong. The model also does not uh, say or predict how frequently gaps will be larger than the average. Though remember, on average, a gap is smaller than log p about 70% of the time. So it came as a surprise that exactly along the prime squares, on average, the gap was larger than expected about 80% of the time. Moreover, the variance of both measures are small, as indicated in the graph. So here you see, this is the average over the 501 samples, and it's approximately 4. And it also has very little variance, all things considered. I mean, the, the, the sample sizes are small. The frequency is the red, the red bars, and that's occurring at about 0.8. That is the frequency that the gap that we find is larger than the expected uh, twice log. It, remember, 70% of the time it should be smaller. We probed the S model's prediction um, about the error function, uh, pi, squared, uh, pi of x squared minus log of x squared, well, in our model, through m is equal to 280,000. Now remember, <coughs> uh, we're measuring along the index. That translates to the prime and then to the prime squared. So when we're finished, these numbers are, are very large, on the order of uh, 10 to the 13. Though vindicating the prediction, the experiment also left us with more questions. For example, we were given the mean of the sets through some trivial mathematics. The variance, however, has remained elusive. 
experimentally we found it's about half the log while the variance for tuples is half the log plus the log uh, the log of the length of the tuple that is the variance is largely independent of the index and highly dependent on the tuple length so since we're measuring at the prime and we predict uh, the number of tuples, uh, the largest tuple length surviving is on order p, the variance of that set should go as about uh, three halves of the log. That is, the relative size of the error to the expectation becomes arbitrarily small as the primes become arbitrarily large. In other words, the noise of the distribution should get smaller as the primes grow. It should get smoother. Here is a set of eight plots breaking up 280,000 samples uh, into eight by 35,000 samples. And we see uh, that in fact it's the space occupied by a random function pi of m uh, is completely filling while well, almost completely filling half the space, which is strange. Uh, although we know we should be able to predict this for other reasons. <coughs> uh, but notice it's hanging around minus one half. Here's up to 70,000, hanging around one half. Note the excursions. The furthest range seems to be minus 0.2 to minus 0.8. It will, it will brush through it, but only ever briefly. By our measurements, it's better than 99.9% .9 less the uh, of the time it spends below inside that range. Now we're at 140,000 and uh, all things considered it's becoming very smooth. In fact um, I would swear even a blind electrical engineer could say that this was uh, a random random matrix theory. That's what the Fourier spectrum should look like. So here we're at 245,000 and growing, and it's getting smooth. And also noticed it's longer wavelengths. And here's the last frame. That is, it really is getting smoother, but something is immediately else, else apparent. Something else is immediately apparent. The mean of the data is not zero, so something truly strange is happening. And it's a who ordered that with a raised eyebrow. From here on, we're just speculating. We can't explain why the average of the noise term is minus one half, but we suspect we'll see this as the periodic nature of the primes. Notice the distinct oscillation about minus one half. In asymptotic terms, this is um, uh, the log integral of uh, our next prime squared subtract the log integral of our current prime by two or in old speak the log integral of x subtract the log integral of root x by 2. Now let's look at the Riemann, Riemann prime counting function and see what we can see. And now these terms are making sense. What we have to explain here is the uh, the sum of the terms that using the zeta zeros. We can rewrite this as our error term and some other terms and this we leave uh, shows us that we have unconditionally that we can squeeze the zeta term into these bounding regions and it might give us a hint about uh, why we have these oscillations however our constructive framework for the proofs is random valued and unbiased between the bounds this while pi of x seems stuck around our lower attractor in 1914 Littlewood proved that pi of x crosses the log integral infinitely often. These crossings occur at what are called skews numbers, and very little is known about them except they are huge. The best estimate for the smallest example is about 10 to the 316. We think a deeper understanding of these numbers and their distribution may lead to a deeper understanding of number theory. Our model predicts an infinite number of crossings in the sense it is an unbiased random model in which the log integral is the expected value of pi of x. It should spend as much time above the mean as below on some scale at least. However, 
It makes no assumptions to the frequency of crossings except that, that is random valued and expected long-term average should tend to zero. Let SKN be the nth skews number. For convenience, set SK0 equal to 1. That is, we'll, we'll say there's a skews crossing at 1 by construction. So here we, we make an error function for the primes at the square and now we build an averaging function and we're only we're going to measure around uh, skews numbers uh, so we're n and g are integral values n is the starting skews number and g is the delta skews numbers away we conjecture that given any epsilon positive and much less than a half there exists an n capital such that the absolute value of our averaging function is less than epsilon for every n uh, greater than this capital N. We have no idea how large it need be, perhaps in the millions, or even scales of skews number squared or worse, or even maybe tiny. We don't know. This while on the scale of single skews increments, we should see it averages to minus a half, or plus a half, depending if n is even or odd. So here's what we think is happening. Uh, the center dark line is the log integral. The blue lines on either side is uh, plus and minus the log integral of root x. Um, we call the log integral the backbone. The red lines are exactly halfway between. They're the log integral of root of x by 2 and uh, we call them subspines. And here comes the primes. They're moving along and spontaneously jump. Then spontaneously jump and keep doing what they do. And you can see how that would build an average close to zero. On a final note, we want to show our results for why we don't need to sample between the squares. We've only sampled at the squares. We can already suppose this region is close to linear following our proof. But how linear, we still can't say. So we tried to measure it. And what follows, we blow up a small segment of 800 uh, samples from our chart around m equals 1,000. This represents the 1,000 primes between here and there. <coughs> uh, or for the squares between here and there. The re results are striking. So... <coughs> This is about the region, this black box is about the region where we would take our sample, around 1,000. So we blow that up, this is 800 points around 1,000, still sampling at the square though, and uh, this line is supposed to try to represent where we're taking our sample from. And when we blow it up to measure it at every prime, we get this pretty striking. There's almost no signal there. And this is in a very early, highly volatile realm. We expect things get a whole lot smoother. On a final, final note, we notice the Wikipedia web page for prime counting function has a nice table of our psi of x through ten, uh, 10 to the 24. We'll flash it for you, but it's admittedly a little unreadable. We can rewrite the last half of the table as follows. And um, sure enough, we can extract from the data everything we need to know. And um, the Riemann hypothesis is, of, of course, true all the way through. Of course it works. It will work through infinity. We just wanted to show, you, show this through the furthest computed numbers to date. Thank you.